Together. Thanks very much. Let's uh, cross to the Armadillo just across the river here in Glasgow where Nicola Sturgeon is taking to the stage to give her leader's speech. She's receiving the applause of delegates there. Let's listen in now to what she has to say. Delegates, we meet here in the city of Glasgow, five months on from the Scottish Parliament election. When we gathered back in March, we were preparing to seek election as Scotland's government for a third consecutive term. Thanks to your hard work and your campaigning brilliance, we did just that. We won the election. From the bottom of my heart, let me say this to the people of our country. Thank you for putting your trust in me as your First Minister. Thank you for choosing us to be your government. The SECC, where we meet today, was first opened back in 1985. It's witnessed quite a few changes in the 30 years since. The biggest change of all has been in the politics of our country and of this city. In 1985, a Scottish Parliament seemed like a pipe dream. Today, it is the beating heart of our democracy. We no longer question if we should have a Parliament of our own. Instead, we ask if our Parliament should be independent. We say yes. In 1985, every constituency in this city, bar one, was held by Labour. Today, the political landscape is very different. Last year, every Westminster constituency in this city was won by the SNP. This year, every Holyrood constituency voted SNP as well. And just last week, just last week, in a council by-election, a massive 19% swing to the SNP secured victory for our brilliant candidate, Chris Cunningham. <laughs> Next year, we have the chance to complete this political transformation. Glasgow was once described as the second city of the empire. In the council elections next May, let's work as hard as we ever have to bring the SNP to power, and then let's build this city as one of the very best in Europe. <laughs> Glasgow is a vivid illustration of the success of our party, but it also stands as a lesson Labour lost because they took the voters for granted. They became arrogant on power. They thought they were invincible and they rightly paid the price. So our promise to Glasgow and to all the people of Scotland is this. We will never take you for granted. We will work each and every day to earn and to re-earn your trust. Conference, it's not just attitude that distinguishes the SNP from Labour. It's policy and principle too. When Labour held its conference in Liverpool recently, its defence spokesman wanted to announce support for the renewal of Trident. He was enraged at not being allowed to go as far as he wanted in supporting weapons of mass destruction. Well, we're pretty angry too. We're angry that with so many children still living in poverty, we have a Tory government determined to waste tens of billions of pounds on a new generation of nuclear weapons.
And we're angry at Labour for meekly falling into line behind the Tories. Friends, I promise you this. No one, no one will ever have to slip a note to politicians in this party reminding us to oppose Trident, now and always with the SNP. It is no to Trident, not in our name. Conference in the conflicts facing the world today, nuclear weapons are not the answer. In Syria, up to 400,000 men, women and children have been killed since the conflict started. Over a million have been wounded. No one can fail to be profoundly moved and deeply angered by the appalling scenes we are witnessing in Aleppo. Innocent children are being killed and wounded with impunity. The barbarism of the Assad regime and the actions of Russia are sickening. We condemn them unreservedly. We agree with the UN that all countries must stand up for the millions of Syrians who desperately need help. And although at times we can feel powerless, we should remember that communities across Scotland are making a difference to families fleeing the conflict. Last month, the 1,000th Syrian refugee was welcomed to Scotland and conference. They are welcome. <laughs> but we can and we must do more, especially for children alone without their parents. So I say to the UK Government today, stop treating this as a migration issue. It is a humanitarian crisis. We must rise to the challenge. <laughs> and Scotland is ready and we are willing to play our part. Friends, it may just be five months since we won the Holyrood election. But in many ways, it feels like a political lifetime. We are in a completely new era, a new political era and a new battle of ideas, a new era for our parliament with new powers and responsibilities, and a new era for our relationship with Europe and the wider world. There are challenges aplenty. And as we face up to them, we must make sure of this that Scotland always remains the progressive, internationalist, communitarian country that the majority of us living here want it to be at all times. <laughs> Make no mistake, today we face a choice of two futures. After last week in Birmingham, there can be no doubt that choice has never been so stark. The primary contest of ideas in our country is now between the SNP and the hard right Tories. The Cameroons have fallen to the Farajistas. And let's face it, the Cameroons were never very appealing in the first place. <laughs> Conference. The SNP's vision for Scotland is welcoming, progressive, open, outward-looking and inclusive. The Tory vision, xenophobic, closed, inward-looking, discriminatory. Let's be frank, the Tories are no longer the Conservative and Unionist Party. After last week, we should call them what they are, the Conservative and Separatist Party, or UKIP for short. Today's Tories display an ingrained hostility to immigration and offer a stony heart to refugees. They treat those with disabilities with suspicion. 
People seeking support to get back into employment are humiliated and harassed. A mother unable to find the bus fare to get to a job centre appointment is more likely to face a benefit sanction than she is to be offered a helping hand. And those from other European countries who have chosen to make their homes here, human beings with lives, jobs and families, they're treated as no more than bargaining chips. Conference, the Prime Minister's position on EU nationals shames her and it will be a stain on her government each and every day that is it allowed to continue. <laughs> the fact is, with almost every action the Tories take, somebody is excluded, somebody loses out, somebody is left behind. So let us make it clear that is not our way, it is not who we are, and it is not who we aspire to be. <laughs> and what of Labour? <laughs> it wasn't meant to be a joke. <laughs> so lost have they become that they preferred the prospect of years of continuous Tory government at Westminster to self-government for Scotland. It is inexplicable, I know, but I guess branch offices just don't have all that much in the way of ambition. Friends, Labour may have thrown in the towel, but let me make this pledge today. The SNP will never stand by while a right-wing and intolerant Tory government undermines the very fabric of our society. <clears throat> At Westminster, we will continue to provide the strong opposition that Labour is failing to deliver. In recent months, it hasn't been Labour asking the hard questions about our place in the single market and the jobs that depend on it. It's been our Westminster leader, our new deputy leader, Angus Robertson. <clears throat> Just as it's been Alison Thewlis making the case against the immorality of denying tax credits to women unless they can prove they've been raped, and Ian Blackford standing against the deportation of the Brain family. Or Mary Black standing up for women denied the pension entitlements they have saved for all of their working lives. <clears throat> the SNP isn't just the real opposition to the Tories at Westminster. The SNP is the only effective opposition to the Tories at Westminster. So our job at Westminster is to provide the strong opposition that is so desperately needed, not just in Scotland, but right across the UK. And our job at Holyrood is to use our powers to build the better Scotland we all want to see. Conference. If you remember just one word from my speech today, I want it to be this one. It begins with an I. No, not that one. Not yet. <laughs> the word I want you to remember is this, inclusion. Inclusion is the guiding principle for everything we do. It encapsulates what we stand for as a party and it describes the kind of country we want Scotland to be, an inclusive country. A country where everyone has the opportunity to contribute to a better future and to share in the benefits of that better future. A country which works for those who value the security they currently have and for those who yearn for change. 
a country where we value people for the contribution they make, not one where we will ever judge them on their country of birth or the colour of their passport. That is the inclusive Scotland we are working to build. And I'm proud of the progress we've made. Earlier this week, a major European research study reached this conclusion on health, on education, on tolerance, and on the environment. Out of all of the four nations in the UK, Scotland is top. Of course, I know there is still much to do, much to do in the next phase of Scotland's home rule journey. Westminster is still responsible for the majority of funding for our public services. But more than ever before, the new Scotland Act means the growth of Scotland's budget depends on the growth of Scotland's economy, creating jobs, expanding the economy and growing tax revenues. These priorities must be at the centre of absolutely everything we do, and they always will be. This time last year, workers at the Tata steel plants at DL and Clydebridge faced huge uncertainty. I stood up at our conference and I promised we would leave no stone unturned in our efforts to find and secure a viable future. We worked with the company, with trade unions, with local government and with the local community. Two weeks ago, I returned to DL with this message for the workforce. We kept our promise, the plant is open for business and Scotland is rolling steel once again. When I think of the many times in years gone by, when Westminster governments have stood by and allowed Scottish industry to wither and die, I think about what might have been. What might have been if there had been a Scottish Parliament and a Scottish Government there to fight for them. What might have been if the people of Scotland had been able to steward the immense natural resources of these lands for present and future generations, just like independent Norway did. So let us... Let us make this resolution today. Never again will we be content to look back helplessly at the damage the Tories have done to Scottish industry and wonder what might have been. We must win the power to always shape our own future. <laughs> Conference, we will not just intervene to save jobs. We will also provide help and support for businesses to thrive. I can confirm today that our small business bonus will be extended. From April the 1st next year, 100,000 business premises across Scotland will pay no business rates at all. Absolutely none. Our new half billion pound growth scheme will offer guarantees and loans to companies seeking to export, expand and create new jobs. And we'll make sure that the benefits of growth are shared more widely. Central to that is our work to extend payment of the living wage. There are currently over 600 accredited living wage employers in Scotland. By this time next year, that number will rise to at least 1,000. That's what inclusion means in practice. <laughs> we will also redouble our efforts to make sure our economy is internationally competitive. That's even more important now in the wake of the Brexit vote. Make no mistake, the threat to our economy is not just the prospect of losing our place in the single market, disastrous though that would be. It is also the deeply damaging and utterly shameful message 
that the Tories' rhetoric about foreign workers is sending to the world. More than ever, more than ever, we need to tell our European friends that Scotland is open for business. And let me be crystal clear about this. We cannot trust the likes of Boris Johnson and Liam Fox to do that for us. So today I can announce a four-point plan to boost trade and exports by taking Scotland's message directly and in our own voice to the very heart of Europe. Firstly, we will establish a new board of trade in the Scottish Government. Secondly, we will set up a new trade envoy scheme. It will ask prominent Scots to help us boost our export effort. Thirdly, we will establish permanent trade representation in Berlin, adding... adding to our investment hubs in Dublin, London and Brussels. And fourthly, we will more than double the number of Scottish Development International staff working across Europe. Men and women whose job it will be to market Scotland as an open economy and a welcoming society. Friends, the difference between the Scottish and Westminster governments is this. They are retreating to the fringes of Europe. We intend to stay at its very heart, where Scotland belongs. <laughs> Conference, inclusive economic growth underpins our entire economic strategy. The Queensferry Crossing, our new bridge across the Forth, has been our country's most important infrastructure project in a generation. In fact, this week it entered the Guinness Book of Records. The central tower of the bridge is the biggest freestanding structure of its kind anywhere in the world. What an amazing feat of engineering. But the most important infrastructure investment of the next few years will be different. It will be childcare. Over this Parliament, we will double the amount of state-funded early years education and childcare for all three and four-year-olds and for our most disadvantaged two-year-olds. Not a bridge over a river, but a bridge to a better future for our children. And today I can announce a new phase in this childcare revolution. Just now it's local authorities who decide what childcare places are offered to parents. Councils work really hard to be flexible, but often the places offered to parents are not where and when they need them. So today we are launching a national parent consultation on how to do things differently. It proposes radical new approaches prioritising choice and flexibility. First, we will propose that parents can choose a nursery or childminder that best suits their needs, and as long as the provider meets agreed standards, ask the local authority to fund it. In other words, the funding will follow the child, not the other way around. And second, as suggested by Children in Scotland's Child Care Commission, we will propose that parents can opt to receive funding in a child care account and then use it to purchase a suitable place directly. Quality, choice, flexibility. These will be the watchwords of a policy to transform the working lives of families and the life chances of our children. And I am proud that it's an SNP government that will deliver it.
There's another policy for our youngest children that I will be very proud to deliver. In the election, we promised a baby box of essential items for all newborns. It's a policy borrowed from Finland where it's contributed to one of the lowest levels of child mortality in the world. So I'm delighted to give you an update on our plans to introduce it here. Next month, we will launch a competition in partnership with the V&A in Dundee for the design of the box. The first boxes will be delivered to babies born in pilot areas on New Year's Day. Now, I don't know about you, but as a first foot offering, I think that beats a lump of coal. And then next summer, every newborn baby across our country will receive a baby box full of clothes, nappies, bedding, books and toiletries. Friends, the baby box is a powerful symbol of our belief that all children should start life on a level playing field. That's what inclusion means in practice. In our schools, raising the bar for all and closing the attainment gap, opening up opportunity for every child, that's the number one priority of our government. It is my personal defining mission. That's why we're directing more funding to areas of greatest need. It's why we've announced our intention to reform school governance, to put parents, head teachers and classroom teachers at the centre of decisions about children's learning. It's why we're working with teachers to reduce workload. And it's why we're bringing greater transparency to school performance so that we can measure the attainment gap accurately and set clear targets to close it. But if we are to live up to our ambition, we have a very particular duty to those most in need. We have to get it right for every child. Recently, I've been spending some time with young people who've grown up in care. Some of them are here today. We welcome you to our conference. <laughs> Their stories have moved me deeply. These young people have challenged me to accept Who Cares Scotland's pledge to listen to 1,000 care experienced young people over the next two years and then to use what they tell me to help make their lives better. I've accepted that challenge. <laughs> Don't get me wrong, many young people who grow up in care go on to do great things. And the staff and the foster carers who work with Looked After Kids do an amazing job. Let us thank them publicly today. <laughs> and real progress is being made. School exclusions are down. The number of children living in permanent rather than temporary replacements is up. But we cannot ignore the reality for too many children in care. Only 6% go to university. Nearly half will suffer mental health issues. Half of the adult prison population are people who lived in care when they were growing up. And worst of all, and this breaks my heart, a young person who has been in care is 20 times, 20 times more likely to be dead by the time they are 25 than a young person who hasn't. Conference, this simply has to change and I am determined that it will change. I'm going to do what these young people have asked me to do. 
I am announcing today that we will launch an independent root and branch review of the care system. It will look at the underpinning legislation, practices, culture and ethos, and it will be driven by those And it will be driven by those who have experience of care. Conference, this is not something that any other country has ever done before. We will do it here in Scotland first. You know, the young people who speak to me make a simple but very powerful point. They say the system feels like it is designed only to stop things happening. And of course, it must have safeguards and protections. But children don't need a system that just stops things happening to them. They need one that makes things happen for them. They need a system that supports them to become the people they can be. One that gives them a sense of family, of belonging, of love. My view is simple. Every young person deserves to be loved. So let's come together and make this commitment to love our most vulnerable children and give them the childhood they deserve. That's what inclusion means in practice. Conference, if there is one institution in our country that embodies the values of inclusion and compassion more than any other, it is our precious National Health Service. Today, there are more staff working in the health service than ever before. Our doctors, nurses, auxiliaries and all of our other health professionals are helping to deliver some of the lowest waiting times and some of the highest satisfaction levels ever recorded in Scotland. So I will never tire of saying this. Our NHS staff, our heroes, each and every one of them, no matter where they were born, deserve our deepest gratitude for the work that they do. Over this Parliament, we will increase health spending by almost £2 billion. That's a necessary commitment, but it is not sufficient. To make our NHS fit for the future, we must reform as well as invest. That will involve tough decisions, but the challenge of an ageing population demands it. It's why our government has integrated health and social care, a challenge ducked by every single administration before us. And it's why we are expanding standalone elective capacity through five new treatment centres. But we must go further. The NHS of the future must be built on a real shift from acute care to primary and community care. So the commitment I am making today is a landmark one. By the end of this parliament, we will increase spending on primary care services to 11% of the frontline NHS budget. That's what doctors have said is needed and that is what we will deliver. <clears throat> and let me be clear what that means. By 2021, an extra half billion pounds will be invested in our GP practices and health centres. And it means for the first time ever that half of the health budget will be spent not in acute hospitals, but in the community, 
delivering primary, community and social care. Building an NHS that delivers today and for generations to come. That is what our government is determined to do. <clears throat> Friends, today I have set out our determination to build an inclusive Scotland. I've talked about our ambitions for our NHS, our economy, our education system and our children in care. I've talked about our hopes for the next generation and for the generations that come after that. Hopes and ambitions that are shared by men and women the length and breadth of Scotland. So as we prepare to take the next steps in our nation's journey, whatever they might be, let us always remember this. There is more, much more, that unites us as a country than will ever divide us. <clears throat> yes voters and no voters, remainers and leavers, all of us care deeply and passionately about the future of this nation. So whatever our disagreements, let us always treat each other with respect. And let's work harder to understand each other's point of view. You know, in a strange sort of way, the events of the last few months might help us do just that. I know how upset I was on the morning of the 24th of June as I came to terms with the result of the EU referendum. I felt as if part of my identity was being taken away. And I don't mind admitting that it gave me a new insight into how those who voted no might have felt if 2014 had gone the other way. Likewise, there are many no voters now looking at the Brexit vote with real dismay and wondering if independence might be the best option for Scotland after all. Let's build on that common ground. <clears throat> Let's resolve that whatever decisions we face in the years ahead, we will take them together respecting each other every step of the way, and let us in the SNP lead by example. <clears throat> you know, this year marks 30 years since I first joined this party of ours. Now, I know what you're thinking. How is that even possible when she's still only 25? Or maybe that's just what I'd like you to be thinking. But in all those 30 years, I have never doubted that Scotland will one day become an independent country, and I believe it today. <laughs> and I believe it today more strongly than I ever have before. But I've always known that it will happen only when a majority of our fellow citizens believe that becoming independent is the best way to build a better future together. So we need to understand why in 2014 that wasn't the case. Some who voted no believed that staying in the UK offered greater economic security, a stronger voice in the world, and a guaranteed place in the EU. Back then, it even seemed possible that there might be a Westminster Labour government at some point in the next 20 years. <laughs> but the future, the future looks very different today. And make no mistake, it is the opponents of independence, those on the right of the Tory party, intent on a hard Brexit, who have caused the insecurity and the uncertainty. <laughs> So it falls to us 
the advocates of independence to offer solutions to the problems they have created. Of course, independence would bring its own challenges. That is true for every independent nation on earth. But with independence, the solutions will lie in our own hands. It will be up to us to chart our own course and be the country we want to be, not the country that an increasingly right-wing Tory government wants us to be. I promised at the start of our conference that we will seek to protect Scotland's interests in every way that we can, and we will. We will work with others across the political divide to try to save the UK as a whole from the fate of a hard Brexit. We will propose new powers to help keep Scotland in the single market, even if the UK leaves. But if the Tory government rejects these efforts, if it insists on taking Scotland down a path that hurts our economy, costs jobs, lowers our living standards and damages our reputation as an open, welcoming, diverse country, then be in no doubt Scotland must have the ability to choose a better future and I will make sure that Scotland gets that chance. <laughs> and let us be clear about this too. If that moment does arise, it will not be because the 2014 result hasn't been respected. It will be because the promises made to Scotland in 2014 have been broken. And above all, it will be because our country decides together that being independent is the best way to build a better, stronger, fairer future for all of us. <laughs> Friends, we know what kind of country we want Scotland to be. And I believe it's a vision that unites us. An inclusive, prosperous, socially just, open, welcoming and outward looking country. The question now in this new era is how best to secure it. Let's resolve as a nation to answer that question together. We have already come so far. Our home rule journey has given us new confidence, new self-belief, a determination not to be taken backwards, but to finish building tomorrow's Scotland. Friends, the time is coming to put Scotland's future in Scotland's hands. Let us get on with making that case. Let's get on with building the country we know Scotland can be. Thank you. SNP leader Nicola Sturgeon taking the applause here in Glasgow at the Armadillo after her awesome conference speech. Uh, she made uh, a number of important policy announcements there, but she did say that Scotland was open for business. You can't trust Boris Johnson or Liam Fox to get a good deal for Scotland. And the policy announcement, she spoke about inclusion and saying she would have a national parent consultation, an independent route and branch review of the care system, some big spending announcements for health, two billion over five years, and increased spending in primary care services to 11% over the five years. She also spoke a lot about independence at the end, just uh, she had a new insight into how no voters felt after the EU referendum. And uh, she says she never doubts that Scotland will be an independent country 
and she says let's get on with making that case. That's her now hugging her mum there in the hall and you see the Scottish cabinet there giving the applause to now uh, press photographers on the stage there. Huge auditorium there, 3,000 delegates at this conference. John Curtis still joins me as we watch these pictures. Uh, Professor John Curtis, first of all, what did you make of that speech? Well, I, we thought we were going to get a speech that primarily focused on the domestic challenges and opportunities that now face the Scottish Government as it embarks on its next five-year term. But in truth, I think we really primarily got another continuation of the arguments and the debate about Brexit and its implications uh, for independence. Now, perhaps it's traditional in SNP leader speeches that we end with the peroration about moving towards independence and eventually it's going to happen at some point in time. But the truth is much of the speech throughout particularly was peppered with these references to the implications of Brexit that we're an open society, etc. So even, for example, when talking about the NHS, there was a reference to the fact that a relatively large proportion of people working in the NHS comes from the European Union, and we welcome them. So in many respects, therefore, this was still a speech about Brexit and independence. I think beyond that, the second thing that was interesting about it, one of the things, of course, that the SNP has long been criticised for is being labelled a separatist party. And, of course, we know that in many other nationalist parties, the SNP certainly excluded, the charge is made is that actually they tend to be rather xenophobic, they tend to be rather in favour of the people who, have, uh, uh, who were born in the country that, that, whose interests they're trying to represent. Now, the SNP have long rejected that notion of nationalism. They've long been a civic nationalist party. But what I think was interesting this afternoon, she said the Conservatives are now the separatist party and was really trying to argue through the, uh, this contrast between inclusion and separation to suggest that actually the SNP was now the party that spoke for the whole of Scotland and that it was the Conservative Party who were the separatists um, and were going down the path that hitherto some of the SNP's critics have argued you know, what, what, what's what they, they, should, they were responsible for. Yes, the Conservative and Separatist Party, not the Conservative and Unionist Party, as she was saying. Now, on the domestic agenda, there was that uh, a moving moment during the conference speech when she announced that independent root and branch review of the care system, and there were young people there who had grown up in care, and Nicola Sturgeon seemed to be quite moved by that, actually. Um, I suppose that was an important policy announcement, wasn't it? Well, it was certainly an important aspiration, though she's not the first First Minister to express concern about looked after children. Jack McConnell, uh, the former Labour First Minister, also used to talk about that um, in his speeches. Um, so certainly it's, emo it's, it's an important issue and we shouldn't under underestimate it. But of course we should bear in mind, you know, the truth is a couple of the announcements were in truth more consultations or review. It's a review about how looked after children are looked after. It was also a consultation about how the childcare provision, which you know, at the moment has been criticised for being too inflexible and therefore parents can't use it, needs to be made more flexible. Again, that was another consultation. A lot of consultations coming up. And I think, in truth, beyond the commitment to moving money into NHS primary care, there wasn't a great deal in the speech that actually involved spending money. Um, though I think it was interesting, given what we were saying just before the speech, there was a clear statement and evidently a clear appreciation that this government's ability to spend money on services will now indeed depend on the state of the, uh, of the Scottish economy. And, of course, they're now linking that requirement to, therefore, one of the reasons why they're wanting to retain relatively open access to the European Union because they're saying, look, the only way we're going to be able to maintain Scotland's economy is through that path. So, that, but, so again, even there, the issue of Brexit again begins to come in. It, we don't get very far in the speech before Brexit and Indiref 2 are somehow or another uh, being portrayed as being an important part of the story. Overriding theme of this conference, indeed, John. Thank you very much for that. Well, our political editor, Brian Taylor, was also listening to the speech and uh, he now joins us again in the Exhibitors Hall. Brian. Andrew, thanks very much indeed. Joined by two journalistic colleagues here. Uh, Hamish McDonald let, let, and, and Andrew Nicholl, let, let, let's go through some of the, the announcements because there were a series of announcements first. That trade announcement, again, some of the UK government are going to say, hang on a second, what is she doing? Is she setting up embassies? 
Well, I think that it's, it's probably largely symbolic in the yeah. sense that, that this is about sending Scottish government representatives out into the world. Yes, it's to do with trade and getting more trade, but it's also about trying to improve the relations the Scottish government yes. has with European countries to say to them, look, we are an inclusive, open country and we're on your Un side. Unlike, the, you know, unlike she's, she's, what you she's trying to create that uh, yeah. dichotomy again, the, isn't she? They may be seen as sort of, as sort of embassies, but they're, yeah, they're slightly more subtle than that, but, but just as symbolic. Uh, Andy, that economic message coming through quite strongly contrasting what she believes can be done in Scotland with what she says is the damage to be created by Brexit. Well, that's undoubtedly true, but even if you do set up embassies in, in Europe uh, to, to make these warm, cuddly, fuzzy relationships with European governments, it doesn't alter the fact that 15% of Scotland's trade goes to the EU and 64% is with the UK. And those are big numbers that are going to be hard to shift by opening a tourist office in Berlin. OK, let, let, let's turn to, I know we're jumping on, but we've got a lot to talk about. The, 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 the childcare announcements and the, and the review of, of, of care, the care system more generally. Mm. What did you make of that, Hamish? Well, I think if you heard that... Big announcements. You know, I mean, the childcare announcement was basically taking power away from councils, or seemed to be taking power away from councils and giving it to parents, giving parents the flexibility on childcare that they've been asking for. Yeah. Now, if you heard that from a Tory government, you'd see it as a Tory policy. It did not feel like vouchers it, to me. It did. I mean, it, it's very sort of populist, parent-friendly. The councils may not like it, yeah. but it is this other thing which Nicola Sturgeon has decided to do to try and cut councils more out of the process and give more power to parents. I think it'll be popular. And, and Andy, that's the child care announcement. We have the care system, children in care uh, system. Um, the, uh, the announcement of a root and branch review of that. The First Minister obviously almost close to, to tears at that. At I that thought point. she was really very, very moved, emotionally moved, really moved. By, by what she was saying there. And when she was reading out these statistics about the health record for kids in care, about yeah. the educational achievement for kids in care, about the fact the mortality that the, rate. the mortality Incredible. rate is absolutely shocking. Yeah. Incredible figure. So quite clearly something has not gone right. Uh, and you, know, you can't fault her for trying it, to put it right. And it would seem that this was this is genuinely driven by, uh, if you like, the, the suggestions she, that she has had coming her way from kids who have been through the care system. So it would appear to be, and you know, yeah. it, it just proves again that the accessibility of the Scottish Parliament, the fact that you can pepper them with things, uh, really is, is working out. Yeah. Uh, uh, Hamish, she said inclusion was the byword, and she gave us a series of examples of that. But she then turned that quite cleverly and quite neatly into inclusion as an offer for independence. Well, that's right. And I think that, that what's behind that is the sense among the SNP leadership <clears throat> that they didn't win in 2014, quite obviously, because they didn't yeah. persuade enough people. So this is a way of reaching out to those people who did not vote yes in 2014 and saying, we will be inclusive, we will look after your interests, come and see what we have to offer. That's, that's what's behind the inclusion. It's, it, it is to be, to be more friendly to the people who have been opposed really to the SNP in the point, past. really like that point, a really interesting point. She was saying on the 24th of June how she felt having her European identity withdrawn and saying, maybe now I get it, yeah. how, the, how the, those who are of a British persuasion felt uh, in, in 2014, or, or could have felt in 2014. And I think there was another subtle message in there when she talked, following on from that, about respect. That's perhaps yeah. a message to someone on the fringes of the nationalist movement who perhaps haven't shown that respect, particularly in things like social media, that she would like them to rein back again to give that inclusive message, show respect for others. And I, I thought did, that yeah. was a very strong point. Yeah. You know, she, She's aware of the problem that exists there, and she was making a point, reach out, find common ground. You have no doubt that this is what that was about. Yeah. Uh, not a bit, because, yeah, yeah. you know... If, if they're going to get beyond 50%, they have to find those people from no voters, you know? Yeah. Uh, and, and, and find people who've been put off and scared and find common ground with them. What I thought was also very, very interesting was when she was making the point in her speech that this referendum, it's not my fault, you did it. That was a, that was a powerful argument she's, as well, She's wasn't pushing it? the blame for the second referendum isn't, very isn't there, much Isn't there a the recognition Tories. that she's aware? The argument that's being advanced by the Conservatives, David Mandel says it almost daily, OK, uh, we are where we are, we are in an uncertain era. Don't add to that with the instability of a referendum. She, she, she must be aware that that's potent but and is trying to counter that. But she's making the point here, this is happening because of broken promises. Yeah. You told us we would have the security of the EU, that hasn't happened. And you she told also, us we'd have the security of the pound and the pound's falling through the floor. Forgive me, Andy, she also said, Hamish, explicitly to the party, we did need win in 2014 because, as you said, not enough backness on the economy, not enough, uh, perhaps there was a series of reasons. In other words, she's saying basically the offer has to be 
enhanced or altered. Yes, it has. And if you look around the conference, I mean, there's boxes and boxes of these survey forms which is going out, which is the other part of this campaign, which is to go out to no voters and say to them, why didn't you vote? for us in 2014, what can we do to change it? Which is, which is the inclusive inclusion agenda writ large, if you like. A question each to you first, uh, Hamish. We, the, we're beginning now the process of the input to the Brexit negotiations from the Scottish Government. Will that uh, prove fruitful or will there be an independence referendum and if so, when? It will not prove fruitful. There will be another independence referendum. I don't see any other reason behind it, but I think we may be some years away from that. Andrew, same question. Yeah, I think the list of demands which is put out saying that the Scottish Parliament should have treaty powers, that we should have control over immigration. It's such a big ask. Obviously, you go into negotiation with a high ask to start yeah. with. But I think these are just unmeetable demands, which will become a causes bailout for the next referendum. And the referendum when? Later rather than sooner, I would okay, agree. Thank you both very much indeed for joining us. And uh, back to the studio.